This evening is about our imagination as individuals. How in the age of what some writers have called the disimagination machine, can we rebuild our imaginations, our ability to, as John, John Dewey put it, see things as if they could be otherwise. After a year of a pandemic that has hugely reduced our ability to interact, how can we create the best conditions to become the imaginative beings that it is our birthright to be, that the world right now desperately needs us to be? How can imagination become everyone's superpower? You're in for a treat, and I'm going to introduce our three guests who are going to bring this question alive for us tonight in the most thrilling way. Suhaima Manzor Khan is an educator, writer and poet from West Yorkshire here in the UK. Her work disrupts and interrupts questions of history, race, knowledge and power, interrogating the political purpose of narratives about Muslims, migrants, gender and violence in particular. Suhaima works to equip herself and others with the tools to resist and dismantle systemic oppression by unlearning the knowledge society and the education system have instilled in us. She was a runner up of the Roundhouse National Poetry Slam in 2017 and is the author of a poetry collection, Post Colonial Banter, co author of the anthology, A Fly Girl's Guide to University, Being a Woman of Colour at Cambridge and Other Institutions of Power and Elitism, which is a title I love, and hosts the Breaking Binaries podcast. Her poetry articles and books can be found on university and school syllabi. She's also been commissioned to write plays by several theatres and is currently an associate artist at Bradford's Freedom Studios and has travelled nationally and internationally performing poems and facilitating political education workshops on a range of subjects. Through all these means and more, Suhaima campaigns against and resists Islamophobia and other state-sanctioned forms of racism, particularly policing and surveillance apparatuses in all their guises. And Phoebe Tickell is an ecologist and innovator, applying the principles of biology and ecology to social systems. In the last 10 years, she's worked as a consultant and advisor on distributed government, governance, ecology, arts, experiential futures, narrative, organizational design, and the imagination. Phoebe recently finished work at the Digital Fund at the National Lottery Community Fund and cares a lot about ethical public interest technology. She's working now on Moral Imaginations, a design lab and partnership community for experiential collective imagination practices, building the case with others for civic imagining towards moral futures. And Tom Doust is a social innovator who spent his 20 year career designing and delivering creative multi-stakeholder programs with children, young people, families, schools and communities across the education, design and cultural sectors. He's a founder of the social in action charity Envision, was a 2013 CLAW fellow with Nesta. He's currently co-director of the Institute of Imagination. The Institute of Imagination champions opportunities for children and young people of all backgrounds to develop their imaginations, a quality that's vital to creativity and the next generation's ability to adapt and thrive in a rapidly changing world. And when I was researching the book from what is to what if I went to a from a, in, in Institute of Imagination event and it was absolutely fantastic. So uh, welcome all of you and we're just going to if this was a real panel in a real venue with a with an audience in front of us we would ask for a round of applause. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to unmute everyone's microphones to greet our wonderful guests uh, in the way that feels most appropriate. Over to you. Hi everyone! Hello! Hi! Welcome! 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 Hello! Wonderful turnout. Fantastic. <laughs> Just as good as the real thing. Thank you so much. Mm. So I'm going to start by asking each of our guests to speak on to speak for nine or ten minutes on our theme. So what are their thoughts on how best to fire or refire our imaginations to exercise and develop our imagination muscle? Let's start with Phoebe. Phoebe, over to you. Gosh, it's really, really exciting um, to be here. And it's so wonderful to see so many faces. It's yeah, almost a bit overwhelming, but um, so excited to be here. This topic is just so important right now and so kind of at the center of um, my heart. And before I start speaking a bit about the everyday imagination, 
I'd like to invite you all to put in the chat um, the end to this sentence. One place that was magical for me as a child was. One place that was magical for me as a child was. I'll just give you 15 seconds or so to do that. Seeing the woods, the stream, the ocean, my grand's living room, more woods, more trees, lots of trees, branches of trees, huge rolling hills, a lake, the garden of my parents, a bay, a beach in Cyprus. And as you think about that, just pay attention to how it feels. How does it feel for you as you remember that place? And we'll come back to this in a, in a little while, but I just like you to, to be in that sensation and, and have that image um, with you as, as we go through the next uh, eight to 10, which just reminded me to start my timer. Great. Um, so I'm part of a group and a project called Moral Imaginations. And alongside others, um, we are building the case for civic imagination. So community imagination to be able to think about and imagine and feel into more moral futures. Um, I think we've got some slides that um, Richard is sh uh, kindly sharing. Thank you, Richard. Um, so this, this term moral imaginations often gets people because it's quite a funny combination of words. Um, but what we really, what it's really about for us is this combination of imagination, something that's create creativity, play, um, you know, this unbounded uh, capacity that we have as human beings. And that combined with, with the word moral, what, the word moral has, has a lot of baggage, um, you know, that I think for different people, it means different things. But what we're really wanting to do is to reclaim this word moral um, and, and reclaim it as what does moral mean to us? What does moral mean to communities? And what do people um, want the future to look like? So uh, next slide, please, Richard. What the project is about is developing uh, imagination exercises and, and developing these practices for collective imagination um, towards, moral, to more, towards moral futures. And we've been working with groups and organizations and networks and communities for the last two years. Um, but particularly in the last year, since the lockdown, we, we published a story called The Impossible Train Story um, that I'm just gonna put into the chat that you can read later on, which was an invitation to imagine um, this metaphor of a story that never, of a train that never stops and it cannot stop, but then suddenly there's a fire in one of the carriages of the train and then the, the train stops for the first time ever and people get off this train and suddenly they can hear birds chirping and they start to hear uh, sounds of nature that they've never heard before. And then when they look ahead of the train, they see a, a, a canyon, they see that the train was actually heading towards a, a cliff edge. And so this was a, a kind of invitation to a shared metaphor for the pandemic and for this moment. And we started inviting people on, into these online sessions where large groups of people would imagine the end to this story. And they'd ask, should we start the train again? What should we do? What, you know, were we even ever on the train? Have we even got off the train? So this was, this was a little um, example of what, what we're trying to do is to use metaphors, to use images, to use play together, collective imagination, social dreaming exercises, to bring people together, to try and imagine a different way forward. Um, and just two, two weeks ago, we finished our first uh, intensive five-day imagination lab uh, with the community in Watch It, um, a few of whom are here today with the wonderful Onion Collective. And we've been working together with a group of around 20 community members to uh, practice imagining and, and do this kind of collective imagination together um, and then dream up what, what could be next for uh, Watch It. So today I'm just gonna talk through um, a couple of things. Rob mentioned that uh, he's, he's looking for a couple of uh, points on, on how we can cultivate the, the imagination. How can we cultivate everyday imagination? And I'm gonna call upon some of the things that we do in moral imaginations, but also um, talk, while I speak, there's gonna be some slides with images um, that were created in this five day lab, just so that you have something beautiful to look at and get a, get a sense of the sort of um, imagery and poetry and art that's, that's come out of this uh, five-day experience. 
So next slide, please, uh, Richard. So the first thing I wanted to mention is um, that we often think about reimagining as a thinking thing. So we think about rethinking, thinking about the future. But what we found is that our imagination uh, practices and, and labs really focus a lot on the feeling. And actually we need to start uh, cultivating a new feeling of the future, feeling into um, what the future can be like. So we, um, we find that creating a space for developing that kind of intuition uh, and, and cultivating a space for the subconscious and, and really creating a safe space for people to be able to reconnect with their emotions and feelings, especially when we're talking about the future. The future, can, it really brings up a lot of very difficult feelings because when we look to the future, we actually reflect back on ourselves. So one of the moral imagination practices asks people to, um, in, it it's walks people through imagining that they're waking up at their 90th birthday and they're speaking to their grandchild in the future. And that grandchild is asking, Granny, what, what, what was it like to be alive when in the great pandemic? What happened? What did you and your friends do? How, how, what did you do and how did it lead us to be in the world we're in today? And in the lab two weeks ago, um, some of, some of the community members reflected back to me like, this is actually bringing up some really difficult emotions. This is bringing up a, kind, a feeling of guilt, feeling of shame, of I should have done more. So there's a, it's interesting, we talk a lot about thinking um, when we think of imagination, but actually we've found that it's a very heart-based, very emotional process. And so part of uh, cultivating kind of everyday imagination, how can we create these spaces where people can feel, reconnect with their feelings in safe spaces um, and, and also reconnect with their sense of intuition? Uh, next slide, please. This was, uh, this was one of the images that came out of the Watch It Lab of an empathy river. So uh, the community was imagining that actually we need to rise up as a, a river of empathy and, and just flood out the, the sticks in the mud, the sticks who are saying, it'll never work, who cares? Um, and I just loved this image and, you know, the, the, the sense of this big flood of imagination that will just completely flood out um, all of the things that are resisting the change that communities really want to see. Uh, next slide. And I did want to read this wonderful quote from Kim Stanley Robinson. I'm sure many of you have heard it before, but he says, the, the virus is rewriting our imaginations. What felt impossible has become thinkable. We're getting a different sense of our place in history. We know we're entering a new world, a new era, uh, and we seem to be learning our way into a new structure of feeling. I'm really interested in what that is, that structure of feeling. This image is from one of our practices where um, com participants, community members are asked to, to connect to this sense of a portal. So in, using the image of a portal to be able to access the imagination. And this point um, I wanted to bring is that although you can't um, guarantee magic, you can create the conditions for magic. And so within the moral imagination labs and sessions, we guide participants through setting up their imagination space bringing items that remind them of, of imaginative times, of magical places from their childhood, all of these little rituals that can help create the conditions to access that place of dreamlike imaginary quality. Um, and, and we talk a lot about serious play in moral imaginations. We, we like to think that uh, imagination has to be playful and unbounded, but we need to take it seriously again. We actually need to really take it seriously and create the conditions and make space in our lives for that. So taking walks, reconnecting with, with a sense of dreamlike quality, recording our dreams, these kind of rituals that can help cultivate that sense of imagination. And another thing I wanted to mention is, you know, imagination is really a very sacred thing. The biggest changes in the world, the biggest, um, yeah, shifts to our society all started in the place of imagination. And I think what's more is that, you know, there's something really exciting about the idea of collective imagining. So we can share an image and come together and actually make um, imagination become real. I think we'll move to the next slide. And this is an image from uh, Sarah Summers, who is one of the community members of Watch It. She's, she's actually here tonight. Um, and I just loved this image. This was a, an, another piece of art that came from the Imagination Lab. And 
just wanted to show that to you. And, and it reminds me to also talk about, um, yeah, these, the, another thing that we bring in in the labs is connecting with a, the place where reality and, and magic blurs. And where can we find these little portals in everyday life? And how, where can we find those when we think uh, back into the past? And, and this image just brings that, that sense of magical realism and, and kind of dreamlike quality as well. And then lastly, again, imagination is often referred to as a kind of solo activity. I think in our society, we think of the people who really imagine our um, you know, authors and artists, and often that can be quite a solo thing. But what we found again in, in the lab and in the sessions is the real key to the creativity that comes out of these sessions. I mean, we've got a scrapbook um, that runs throughout the, the five days and with the Watch It community, you know, I was imagining maybe like 20, 30, pages we've got 156 pages of poetry artwork um, imagery all sorts of things that are just absolutely extraordinary and when we've reflected on you know how how did this happen where did this come from we think it's because it's a collective imagination process and that's my timer so I'm just going to finish that sentence that it we really think it's down to this uh the, the way we do the imagination process in, in these sessions is that it's not about, you know, Phoebe or uh, Rob or Brendan and, and, you know, us as individuals, it's that we're creating together and it's that magic of actually creating together that also takes the pressure off. Um, and then the creations are so much bigger than, than what we might have expected for any one of us alone. Uh, I think we're at the end of the slides. I think there's maybe just a couple more that you could just click through and then um, I'll finish. That's the train story uh, exercises. We're thinking about the image of the train and stopping and watch it and what comes next. Um, next slide. And this is um, as part of this project, we've been using these images and imagination exercise to imagine a new economics. And so this is an image of, of the way we were thinking about a, a new economics of attachment, which is Onion Collective's wonderful, wonderful project. And I think the last slide the no judge club so that's something that's coming out of the imagination lab there's all sorts of ideas and things that the community are putting into practice and action but one of my favorites is the no judge club um i think started by kate who's here um and and i just love this concept of having a club where people can come together regularly and just speak and be kind and share ideas without judgment so that's all from me um looking forward to the rest of the discussion Phoebe, thank you so much, and it's, it's it's so wonderful that you're that you're joining us fresh off the back of of doing the work in Watch It, and that we have some people who are part of that process uh, here with us this evening. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Suhaima. Uh, Suhaima, over to you. Hey, I thought we were going in different order. So oh, sorry, no, did I get that wrong? Oh yeah, no, it's, I'm reading my notes. Sorry, Tom. Tom. <laughs> What a professional I am, Tom. <laughs> I'll, I'll undo what I what I just re undid and bring my slides back on. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Phoebe, for setting the scene so eloquently. Um, and it's so great to see so many people uh, joining us this evening and so many faces in support of this um, this pursuit of this question. Um, and so I think probably the best place for me to start is this notion of imagination. And I think it's important because it's timely, um, this acceptance that actually imagination is now a mainstream thing and we need to be taking it more seriously. No longer should we be looking upon it as a, a frivolous act. Um, let's celebrate it for what it is. And as Rob said at the beginning, it really is a superpower. It has an ability for us to step outside of our current context to see the world in a different perspective and to generate a new thinking uh, a new, and to generate new ideas. And of course, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bang that drum of imagination. It's something that my organization does and something I do every day in my work. But importantly, it's... Sorry about that. I just lost your internet, sorry. Um, so sorry, I was just saying, it's important to, to bang the drum of imagination. It's something I do, it's something I champion, it's something I do every day in my work. But it's also my job to, to make the connections to, to imagination and to, to understand why imagination matters. And we need no further than say, the World Economic Forum to see the core skills 
uh, that, that for young people will need in 2021. Uh, beyond just maths and literacy, uh, things like creativity and collaboration and problem solving, these all stem from our ability to build this imagination superpower. In 2018, the OECD published a report on creativity and critical thinking in, in schools, and they placed imagination at the heart of the report and at the heart of this learning model. So while it, we don't think it's mainstream, it is actually becoming more and more mainstream. And I think the last 12 months has really uttered this new word of, of reimagining. How can we reimagine? So let's start talking about this incredible superpower, this human skill that unlocks many of the other skills that we'll need now um, and for the future. And I guess just thinking about this question and how we can be more aware of our imagination. Um, I think once we've accepted imagination as superpower, it's important to recognize that uh, we have this ability to imagine at different times. We can't always turn on our imagination like a tap. I don't know about you, but my imagination is most active at quite accidental times. It sometimes feels more of a, a game of chance as when my imagination is on. But I do find it happens more often when my mind is wondering or I'm engaged in non-taxing tasks. And JK Rowling came up with Harry, Ron and Hermione when she was essentially stuck on a train between Manchester and King's Cross, mind wandering and staring out of the window. Newton's law of gravity came to him not when he was engrossed in activity, but when he was sitting under a, a apple tree in an orchard. So I believe the more we can become conscious of these moments, the more we can ensure that we have the ability to take on board these opportunities to imagine in our daily life make time for them, enable imagination to flow, recognize when they are and seize them. If it's a state of light sleep when your imagination is best, then find ways of tracking and taking down ideas. If it's when you're in the shower and you have ideas, make sure you've got something to, to grasp hold of and uh, write down those ideas as, as you come out the shower. So thinking about imagination, there are some ways in which we can cultivate it. And um, we've already heard about playful, playful learning. Um, and I think play really does allow us to open up our imaginations more deliberately. And one definite way is to find ways in which um, play can be integrated into our everyday life. I mean, we talk about the importance of children and their need to have opportunities to have open ended play. Uh, um, a practice that we definitely need to see more uh, welcomed in our education system. But I think we should be talking about lifelong play because it's such a key way that we need to carry it through our lives. And I'm not just talking about, say, Google head office making their space more playful with slides and comfy chairs. It's more about a play mindset, our ability to be naturally more curious and to ask more questions. And this really relates to the environment that we're creating, the, the opportunity to talk about areas that offer freedom, freedom to experiment, to tinker, to iterate, to rapidly prototype and to go back to the beginning if it doesn't work out, or maybe even discover something different and unexpected. So let's create those right settings for play to cultivate our imagination. Now, not everyone is comfortable with play. Adults find it hard to relate to sometimes, even parents and carers can struggle with the concept of playing with their children. But there are other ways to cultivate your imagination. And I've talked about how imagination can't just be imposed, but it can be grown. There are opportunities to find delight in uncertainty and ambiguity. It can lead to broadening your perspective and the way you look at something perhaps differently. And at the Institute of Imagination, we developed an interactive machine called the IOI Sphere. This um, wonderful machine had 202 switches powered by a microcomputer, but engineered into an interactive exhibit that could be played with. And each switch did something different. So you could create sound, you could play games on it. One switch even blew a big gust of air in your face. It was completely random. So how can we switch up our habits? What can we do differently in our lives to open up the unexpected, to enable us to have a different perspective? And I'm thinking of this particularly in the context of COVID and the post-COVID world that we're emerging into. How can we reconnect with the world to break our daily habits, which have been so familiar 
over the past um, 12 months. There are times for order and structure, of course, but there, when you're applying your imagination, I think mess can really help strengthen it. And we believe strongly in the power of making, of taking a concept from your imagination and bringing it to life through making and tinkering, both physically and digitally. And when you look at Einstein's desks, I don't know if you've ever Googled Einstein's desk, but it's not, it's certainly not clean. It was extremely messy. Um, and we found that mess in our environments brings opportunities or options for materials and tools, things that maybe you didn't have before. We really believe in working in interdisciplinary environments where the arts and the sciences and the digital technologies all fuse together as one. And this really results in a broad range of tools and materials being used to experiment. So mess is often seen by adults as problematic, but we can turn mess to our advantage when we link it more to open-ended and open-ended solutions and, and thinking about building uh, you know, opportunities. So to finish, let's look at our confidence in this, in this realm. Um, we've said we need to embrace imagination as a superpower. We need to be taking it more seriously. We need to throw aside the idea that it's a frivolous act. But we also need to become more confident in the world of imagination and ideation. So if you look at this first model on the left, it's representative of our ability to accept failure alongside success. The more peaks and troughs we can demonstrate, the higher level of creative confidence we can grow. And with the model on the right, this is more representative of our ability to feel confident with generating ideas. We should be interested in the sheer number of ideas generated as well as, as, well as the good, good sort of quality ideas that come out of that. And we refer to this as divergent thinking. So here we begin by seeking quantity and not quality and advocate the notion that no idea is a bad, sorry, that no idea is a bad idea. And if we're having just one idea when we're generating ideas, it's not representative of, or not, we're not really representative of our creative confidence. So just to finish off then, these are just some of the ingredients that we think we can use to cultivate everyday imagination. And we wanted to throw them into the mix and hope that they are useful for the discussion as we uh, move on this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. And my, uh, my overriding memory of when I visited the, uh, the Institute of Imagination event in London was my feeling of sympathy for whoever had to clean up afterwards uh, was definitely one thing. And, uh, and it was amazing how, how the adults who in initially arrived and sort of stood around saying how great this is that our kids are now playing creatively, after about an hour realized they could too and everybody was playing and it was really just a magical thing to see. I recently read the biography of um, Tove Janssen who wrote all the um, Moomin books and about the house she grew up in surrounded by art and paint and stuff all over the place and how formative that was in her evolution as an imaginary person and I love the Moomin books uh, so now Suhaima over to you hi good evening everybody thank you Rob um really lovely to be here with you all um I'm going to jump straight in with the poem because I'm a poet and I speak better when I when I poem uh so this is just an excerpt from one of my poems in my collection, and it goes like this. One, what would being safe look like? What would it look like to feel truly safe? How would that sit on our bodies? Would it look like being free to walk aimlessly in the night? Would it look like being free to walk aimlessly in the day? What would it feel like to be so big we were safe? What would it feel like to be dark and big and safe, to exist in big ways, to take up space, to be big beyond borders, to be spilling over seas, over lands, over seas, too big for prisons, too big for detention centres, so big that bullets bounce off, so big they can't deport us, too big for natural disasters, tornadoes and tsunamis, big like superpowers. Big like blocking bulldozers that come to smash your door down. Big like keeping the door closed to riot police. Big like small children's dreams. Big enough to turn the Earth's orbit in another direction. Big enough to move mountain ranges back under the sea. So big no one steals the land from us the first time. So big we don't think of the land as ours. So big that we are the land. All the land is us and there is no land or us. There is you and me and we and we and we. So big that I am you. 
so big that when we cry, the world ends too. But what about being too big? Big like the only way I know you're big is that there is someone else left small. Big like making someone else feel small. Big like unfair, like overexpansion, like that's actually somebody else's space. Big like empire, like colonization, like a blooming flower that is not a flower but a tree, not a tree but a forest, not a forest but a forest fire burning down a mountainside. Big like grief, like genocide, like speaking over us, like erasing us, like no one is listening, like you may as well be background noise. Three. Why are we afraid to be small though? We want to be so big, so big, so big, so big. Why are we afraid to be insignificant? To be so small, we rely on one another. So small that alone, we are nothing. I wanted to begin with that poem because I'm interested in the impact, thank you, that the ways that we imagine ourselves have on us. So in that poem, I was imagining what it would be like to feel safe initially. And to me, safety kind of conjoined somehow with being big, right? And I realized maybe I didn't feel big, I wanted to feel big and full. And that made me question then, what is it when we're talking about imagining, what is it we want to imagine, right? I think we have to be quite clear about not what it will look like, that's what the imagining is for, but what, what it will feel like, as Phoebe really well said. Will it feel like being free? Will it feel like be, having justice? You know, we need to be quite clear about that because this is also about what we're not going to reproduce in our imaginings, right? What do we not want to be in the, in the world we imagine? So I think for, for me, I'm always very clear. I can't imagine in a way that reproduces the logics that underpin capitalism, imperialism, white supremacy, uh, you know, the, the factors of conflict and war that produce climate catastrophe, that produce pandemics like the one we're in today. I don't want to replicate any of those logics in what I imagine, which ironically means I have to imagine something unimaginable, right? And I think this is the job of all of us to imagine the unimaginable. And it sounds ironic, okay, and it sounds difficult. And that's why I think, as has been mentioned by both the brilliant speakers, we, we have to do it together. So I have to, this is a theory I came up with today, by the way. <laughs> this is, I'm going I'm to say it as if I've always had this theory. I think there's two key elements. Um, as a poet, these are the two elements I think are key to it, reimagining our, our lives individually and our, our lives collectively, which is equals the world, right? And number one is curiosity for the mundane, right? I'll go into that a little bit more in a second. Number two is play, and this has been mentioned by everybody so far. So what is curiosity for the mundane? What am I talking about? I'm talking about being really fascinated by the most ordinary things, being really willing to ask questions about the things we take for granted and about seeking answers in those things already around us. So I have a podcast called Breaking Binaries. Um, and I only mention it because, you know, for me, this is what I'm really interested in. I'm interested in the idea that there are no, there's, that there's never two options. There are no opposing ideas, right? That actually all words are just hiding something. They're hiding what other ideas may exist. They're hiding things that if we ask questions, we begin to see. So I believe that a lot of what we look at in the world around us is really just what we've been told to see of the world around us. And if we ask questions like who benefits from this? What else could exist if this didn't exist? we would start to see other things. So the first episode I ever did was on the topic of innocence and guilt, right? And once you start even troubling these quite foundational concepts, these concepts that we quite, we really need, right? We want to be seen to align with some of these ideas. We don't want to be the other one. But when we start to question these ideas, when we're willing to kind of feel that fear, allow our curiosity to wander, we start to see many things around us don't have to be this way, right? So maybe we don't have to incarcerate people for life based on an action that they did one time because of a context that they grew up in, because of structural dynamics and processes, or right? maybe there are other ways to build a world. The other part about curiosity for the mundane or in the mundane is that I think the mundane things around us hold so many of the answers we're looking for. I feel frustrated sometimes that, you know, people kind of, when we think about imagining, I think sometimes people are looking for blueprints, right? Like how are we going to create this other world? And actually the reality is that we're already creating it every day. And I, I think, a lot of the most imaginative forms of creation are actually overlooked by us because they're done by people that we do not value. So I'm talking about undocumented people. I'm talking about women of color. I'm talking about disabled people, people who are sick and chronically ill. So what I mean here is that there are already ways that they imagine living that are unimaginable, that are made unimaginable by the world. So a really simple example, right? 
when a caregiver, often a woman, uh, says to two children who are arguing, right, stop arguing about that toy, you've got to share it. It's both of your toys. This might not sound radical, but think about what's going on here, right? There's a de-escalation of conflict that occurs through reimagining ownership as collective. Right, so this, this caregiver has just said, no, there is no such thing as individual ownership. We collectively own this thing and your conflict must de-escalate de-esca- now because we have to move away from this individualistic consumptive thinking. Right, and, and like that seems so simple and boring and sort of dismissed. But I think what, what would it look like for us to imagine that on a bigger scale? If we were to collectively redistribute the resources of the earth to de-escalate conflict, it would definitely work. I can, I can kind of uh, assume that much, uh, but we kind of don't see these, these avenues that already exist as potentials. Um, what happens when undocumented people, I think are a great example, right? People who have to cross borders because of the violence of you know, historic colonialism that has ravaged lands, created famine today, drought today, uh, all the kinds of uh, climate catastrophes, flooding that we see displaces millions of people, the wars, the war on terror, all these wars that displace people, people then have to move, right? But when they cross borders, they already imagine a world without borders. They already imagine it's possible that the resources stolen and hoarded by Europe can be reclaimed by those they were stolen from can be reclaimed by those whose labor was devalued to produce them. And I think there's something really radical in that as well, right? What does it mean for us to then actually reframe those relationships and think that these people are offering another way of us all existing? So I'm excited by that. And I think it reminds us that we should ask different questions. I remember just really quickly um, reading a wonderful example of how a local community just reimagined their world, right? So there was a lot of violence that would occur on one particular street. Uh, one particular location. So the mothers of the area decided, let's set up a barbecue on that street corner and we'll sell burgers there and people will buy them. And you ch- you transform this corner from a place where people get killed to a place where people come to socialize, where people can chat, they can have food. And you know we know food is often a really lovely place for people to build relationships. But it took something as mundane and overlooked and derided, I would say, as cooking women's work, right? As care, as love. And this is something I think is really important is that love and care are such derided forces, right? But these are the forces that make people commit to moving their entire lives just on the hope that maybe my child will have a different future. And we don't see that as as a radical imagining, but it absolutely is. How extraordinary to imagine that your child might live when you never could. I think that's, that blows my mind. And the second thing I mentioned with just 30 seconds to go is play. Um, You guys have all mentioned play already, and I guess what I just want to emphasize about play is that it's different to performance, right? And I was thinking about this today, that when you go to see a play, you are seeing a performance of play, but play itself is not performance. And I think the distinction here is that oftentimes we, I think because of the climate we live in now, where you you kind of encourage to to, to tell people what your, your kind of moral compasses or tell people your ethics or your politics but not to just do it to live it and I think there we go that's my 10 minutes I'll just be about 30 more seconds I think play is about trying trying anyway trying despite what it might look like trying behind closed doors and I think it's also about not just failing I think failing is absolutely true as as Tom said but I think also being able to admit that we were wrong, to say that we, we, the premise was wrong entirely, to admit that we excluded somebody, to admit that our imaginings didn't include everybody. I think it's okay to admit that and to move through that. And I think that is how we will overcome a lot of fear because there is a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear that we can't imagine beyond this, but there's also fear that we might imagine wrongly. And I think we have to kind of concede we may, but we will be willing to retry, retry, retry. Um, and I think that is how we will get to another world. So I'll end there because I'm already over time. Thank you. I don't think you need to worry, Suhaimer. I think you could just keep talking for the next hour and everyone will be delighted with it. <laughs> um, uh, Kath Lucas just put, you are imagination personified. Uh, and uh, I was thinking when you were speaking about when your uh, curiosity for the mundane, one of my favorite pictures is, is the, the, the Van Gogh's painting of his yellow house that actually for him, he saw that house as being where he was gonna start a movement that was gonna change the future of art. And for him, it all embodied all of his hope and possibility. Actually, it was a really scuzzy little house in a really grotty little part of town. And he painted this picture of it as if it was like the sun, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and, uh, and I'm just reading um, 
Marielle McHubber's book, which is just amazing. And there's a quote in there that just it, it really gets me where uh, by Erica Miners, who said, liberation under oppression is unthinkable by design. Which I think is, is liberation under oppression is unthinkable by design. So, wow, you, we have had the most delicious uh, early evening feast. So it's over to you now, as Rich was saying, do write any questions that you have uh, in the chat. And while you're doing that, and while Rich is then sort of sifting questions and putting them together so we can pick out the main themes, I'd like to just ask our guests first if there was anything that the other two speakers said that they found especially interesting or challenging or inspiring or fascinating, any reflections that you might like to share on what you've heard? Maybe Tom, can we start with you? Sure. Um, yeah, it's just great to be part of such a, a wonderful collection of, uh, of discussion. And um, both Phoebe and Zuhaima were, were talking about this notion of collective imagination and the socialization of imagination. Um, which I think is really important in this this era that we enter into post COVID, and coming back together and, and placing imagination at, at the heart of that socialization, um, and the, the, then the, and ha harnessing the power of imagination. And I quite liked the way that um, the speakers talked about the emotional side of our imagination. So, how can we connect more emotionally? We've just been through an incredibly emotional twelve months. How can we harness that emotion um and you know some of that emotion has been has been negative but some's been very positive we've been very resilient through covid i think as human beings so how can we harness that and connect to that emotional feeling so then i guess going that step further um and phoebe touched on this as well is like how can we sense imagination what does it feel like how do we touch it how do we grasp hold of it and, and really take it on board before. Thank you. Uh, Suhaima? Yeah, um, I think I really enjoyed um, just some of the questions that Phoebe was raising um, about like the things that you asked participants and it reminded me actually of a um, really brilliant talk that I watched um, by Jackie Wang and she writes about carceral capitalism so this idea that um, you know due to debt essentially and mortgages and rents and all these kind of things that people owe um, you know it creates this incarcerating regime and she asked this brilliant question where she just sort of said to everybody close your eyes for a moment and I want you to imagine um yourself feeling really safe um so everyone closes their eyes imagine and then she says um how many police officers were there and I think it's such a great question because I think when we do those kinds of questioning and answering it also helps us to uh, to recognize that you know, what's actually unimaginable is, is the world as it is. This is really just like not intuitive in any way, the way that things are ordered. So yeah, I found that really um, useful. And um, I was thinking about Tom, the just, even just some of the images, like I think when you were talking about mess a lot, it was also just making me think about the material conditions necessary for us to imagine sometimes that like we, like you can't just sit on your own in a room and imagine like you, it requires, I don't know, movement and touch and, all that very sensory stuff and I think that's also part of a bigger thing where it's like to imagine that different world there's actually I, th I think you know there are some basic minimums required and sometimes I think we think they're the things we've got to imagine for example you know just redistributed global resources you know it's like that's not actually what we're trying to imagine that's like the basic minimum required for us to imagine how to exist in more you know livable safe exciting full ways so yeah I found I found both of those really yeah, just exciting to think about. Thank you. And so, Haima, thank you so much. Phoebe? Ah, so the thing that uh, really stood out to me from both uh, Suhaima and Tom is this, um, this, the image that is in my mind is like soil and mess and stuff that's com complex and the imagination is not sterile. It's not happening in the in the kind of boardrooms and the you know the agendaed meetings the the stressful work environments workplaces actually it's happening like off 
off the script, it's on the territory, it's on the ground. We're not even seeing, like Sahima, what you said, like we're not even seeing that the radical imagination that is happening already all the time by people that we just don't consider as, um, you know, innovative or, you know, ha don't have the right, um, you know, Twitter profile or whatever, you know, like that basically it's happening like on the ground. And there's something so exciting about that to me. Um, it, and and like, I know I keep talking about Watch It because we've just come out of this lab, but one of the things that really struck me was when, when we worked with this train metaphor, um, some of the community members said, I, I just think we were never on the train, to be honest. Like, and, and that was such an interesting reframe of like, it, and then it connects to what you were saying, Sahema, it's just like, actually, um, you know, often when we talk about some of the places in, in the UK as being kind of left behind, uh, something actually Georgie I think you said from Onion Collective said actually you know we don't consider ourselves left behind we we consider ourselves ahead of the curve because you know you're going to be joining us you know we're not we're not left behind and the real creativity and, and, and energy and kind of ideas are there so that that really uh, resonated for me and and this this thing about mess and Tom seeing those images of those like it was just so heartening because it's just been such a long time since I was in like a creative space like that like an art studio and you've got all these materials and stuff like sticking off the walls and and yeah I just like really miss that so I just I like I really enjoyed seeing all those images and kind of reminding me as well of like spaces in like schools and and you know we need more of those kind of places that um are not linear they're not regimented it's not some, somebody once said imagination cannot be um you know timetabled and, and you can create the conditions but you can't make it happen so there's so there's there are lessons there so thank you yeah I, I saw an article recently about in japan they're building a uh, the first completely sort of zero carbon neighborhood or something. So they had all these architects plans and things of what this place was going to look like. And they had a picture of this apartment that was this sort of steel and glass kind of supposedly eco apartment with these kids sitting on this sofa in this pristine room with this pristine table and prist everything completely pristine. I thought that looks like the most miserable, awful uh, childhood. They clearly didn't have anyone who knew about play involved in designing this place. Um, so uh, we're going to pick some questions out and actually invite the people who wrote the questions if they'd like to ask them themselves. Jenny, you wrote a really good question uh, about the sort of uh, um, social equality dimensions of imagination. Would you like to unmute your microphone and ask your question yourself? Yeah, let's just um, you and your find it again. Because <laughs> uh, my I, I'm not that articulate at, anymore at this time of night. Um, how can someone exercise their imagination when their lives are relentless stress and worry due to poverty? Um, how can people hope for the future if they've lost all trust in the system to look after them? Um, because we do want to include uh, people in that collective visioning and not sort of leave them behind. Thank you. Yes, yeah, a really important question. And we're, uh, there was earlier in the chat, there was discussion of Robert McFarlane. I remember when I invited him for the book, he, he said, imagination is a function of privilege, uh, which is a really interesting kind of way of looking at it. Tom, let's start with you. What, do you, what, how, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I, I was conscious as we were all talking that that we it is it is perhaps seen as a, a privilege. Um, and I guess, that, you know, arguably imagination can be dangerous as well. It can send you down the wrong way or you can you can imagine something that's not not great and not good. And I guess from our perspective in, in our context, um, we see imagination as um, a, a well-being tool. So the notion that you can come in and apply your imagination through through creativity is a way of stepping out of your current context and perhaps getting involved in something that uses your hands to bring something to life um, through making, through tinkering, through experimenting. And so I guess, um, you know, I, I, I feel that imagination if it's channeled correctly and if we can have the right support networks there through through community support, um, people can go go to a place where they can apply that imagination, then it's very much a tool to support people 
in in reimagining something that hopefully is not is not negative but is positive and and seeing a way out of their situation but absolutely i think the bottom line is that poverty is just you know, we need to get rid of poverty in, in this country and around the world for us to be all to be able to then be in a position to take this this opportunity to reimagine positively. Thank you. Thank you. So, Haima? Yeah, um, I actually disagree, um, not in a controversial sense, but in the sense that I think when you live under conditions of capitalism and you are in debt, impoverished, living in poverty, I think imagination is the one thing that people use consistently, right? You have to imagine, how am I going to spread five pounds over all of these things that I need to afford? How am I gonna share childcare whilst I also need to go to work? How am I going, you know, think about single mums who live in poverty in the UK. I mean, 50% of Muslims in the UK live in poverty. So this is something I think about a lot. You know, how can the Muslim community imagine living, you know, in non-criminalized conditions when we're just trying to pay our rent every day, we're just trying to pay our mortgages. But the reality is you, I think we've, we're perhaps framing this incorrectly if we're thinking about it as like, how do we include people in conversations about imagining? This goes back to what I was saying. That I think the imagining already exists. It's that we're not looking, you know, if, if we're in these positions where we're just like, imagining is this thing that you have to like go away and do for five days at a time, which I think there's space for that and we need to do that. I, you know, I think we're, we're overlooking the fact that people are imagining all the time. And like, that's why I mentioned undocumented people, right? People who are displaced, impoverished, their imagining is so is so much a product of having to realize that conditions of capitalism are unlivable, unsurvivable. So how do they imagine surviving? They do things every day that are just abnormal to us, right? We don't even have to think like that. So I would say the opposite. I would say living with relative wealth under capitalism, you know, benefiting from the exploitation of people in the global south, benefiting from the exploitation of displaced, marginalized, migrant, precarious people, workers actually dulls your imagination incredibly so because you think this is normal you think this is the the best that we can kind of do and this is what we need these are the conditions we need to imagine from and that's why kind of what i was trying to say in my last point was that actually we need to completely change these conditions to all be able to imagine differently and it's sort of that maybe we're wrapped up in the wrong point of imagining at the moment we need to get to the place where i think what I would, would agree is that, you know, there's not a democratization in the sense of time to imagine, resources to imagine. But the reality is that so many people would be dead if they didn't imagine differently. And, and I think imagining and hope is the thing that gets people through immigration detention, right? Where you're literally put in, you're in torturous conditions where you don't know how long you're going to be detained in the UK, for example. But I could go on. But yeah, I just think, yeah, I think it, we need to reframe that a bit and think about actually, is it a question of, yeah, what do we mean when we say imagination? Thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. I couldn't couldn't agree more. I don't have that. I don't have much to add, uh, Suhaima. I, I was just thinking, um, you know, in a sense, it maybe it's actually those who have lost the most trust in the current system who are able to most imagine something different. Because obviously, if we were attached to um, the system as it is, then then it's hard, you know, you're, you're, you need to believe in it working to stay in your position in a sense. Like there's a sense of like, um, if, if you're trying to maintain the status quo, then, then why would you start radically reimagining um, something that is truly like radically different? Um, I, do, I do completely agree that there's a kind of time inequality there and that, you know, like taking out time just to imagine, you can't do that if you're actually fighting for survival. But I do agree that maybe when we're talking more about creativity, which is 100% what imagination is all about, like, I don't, I actually find, um, I, I agree with Suhaima, the, the opposite. And um, I've noticed as well that when I've hosted moral imaginations in my like, organizational settings versus in a community setting, it's a very, it's very, very different. And that's not to say anyone's better at imagining than others. But I think in an organizational setting, we we have to play these roles, we have to be certain people, we have to stay on a certain script and stay well behaved in a sense. Whereas in the community setting, it's just like a complete riot. And um, you know, we've just it, yeah, so it's just interesting to to see that and think about what binds us, what binds our imagination actually. Um, and what allows that total unbounded kind of radical imagination. Thank you, thank you. Uh, our next question, I'm going to invite Paul from Liverpool. Paul, you had a question about evidence-based arguments. Can I bring you in to ask that yourself? Hello, yes. 
Um, yeah, so it's just shortly, um, I'm just wondering if there's any evidence base we can use to argue for the power of imagination um, with organisations that don't really value imagination as a superpower. For instance, the authority is just a bit of a bugbear for many. Paul, Paul, your, uh, your signal is terrible, Paul. Um, if it's all right, I might just I might just reread your question because uh, you're you, you were breaking up quite a lot there. So Paul's question was, how can we make evidence based arguments in favor of imagination to bodies that do not value this? Uh, maybe Phoebe, let's start with you. Uh, that's a great, really great question. I, I would say point point me to one really radical innovation or piece of social change that didn't start in the imagination like where just that that's where i would start um how we make evidence-based arguments in favor of imagination uh, i struggle with this because as soon as you start putting kpis on imagination i feel like it's probably just going to naturally kill it so i would be careful about that um but maybe pointing to the kind of creativity that that comes out of these spaces for collective imagining pointing at uh, you know, hearing from people who who um, you know are able, have those have been in those spaces and and uh, yeah, hear about their experience. So it's not it's not a great answer, but that's that's what I've got. Thank you, Tom. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I would argue that that it just needs connecting up to the evidence that already exists out there. Um, and so I, I reference people like the World Economic Forum and and the OECD and whether that's right or not to be referencing them. But, you know, the language they're using and the skills they're talking about all track back to the, where imagination takes us, if you like, and, and the skills that, that we need for that. So it feels like there's uh, this kind of gray area in the middle. Um, we have imagination on one side and we have these future skills or attributes um, that are key for, for a next generation to, to grasp hold of. And, and Resilience is obviously one of those hugely important ones. Um, and my hope is in some ways that if anything good comes from, from COVID is that there's a realization that these, these skills are not needed tomorrow or in the future, but, but now absolutely, you know, for us to, to work our way out of this, this situation. Thank you, thank you. And Suhaima? Yeah, I think, so here's another question. Do bodies that don't value imagination deserve to exist and, and I'm being serious <laughs> because it's like I think sometimes we put so much effort and energy into how are we going to you know persuade everyone you know change everyone's mind get everyone to the truth is we're going to have to leave some things behind we're going to have to just, something's just going to have to not make it into the future and you know maybe that's that feels really impractical for whatever specific situation you're thinking about um, but I think the other part of that is that, you know, evidence ba evidence based just as a phrase is like so steeped in layers of assumptions in of itself, right? Because what evidence counts as evidence to certain bodies, right? Because if, if it's like, what more evidence do you need than the world is like unlivable right now? You know, that, that's surely that's evidence for imagining, but it's not, that's not going to be enough for some, some bodies. So yeah, I think that then begs the bigger question about like, what's the purpose of imagination? Because I think the other part of this is that I think some we're seeing at the moment a lot of the co-option of these kind of conversations as well, right? So you have these organizations that are actually deeply invested in the status quo, but they want to be seen to be, they, you know, they see these buzzwords and they're like, oh yes, reimagining, that's what we're doing too. And it's like, no, you're not, you're just rebranding. And I think that's also a concern, right? So it's so should we just automatically be in favor of anything that's about reimagining, or is it really about like the, the processes that are underpinning it? So yeah, just just questions. Wonderful. Yeah, I I was uh, it, it, the first the first couple of lines of the poem that, that you shared with us, Suhaima. Firstly, firstly, really really touched me in terms of what's been happening in London over the last couple of days, um, and and also the uh, one of the people I interviewed for the podcast uh, was someone involved in wellbeing economics, who talked about how one of the measures that they use. Uh, for well-being was the number of girls who can walk home on their own after dark 
because in order for that to be in place so many other things have to be in place and have to have improved and that's like one of the ways that you would tell so i like that you can't in that you can't measure the imagination of the population of a city but there are things that you could look for that would that would suggest that this is kind of going in the right way you know um so john schofield you had a really good question about uh how to kind of uh the fact that our imaginations have are, have a lot of us have grown up with our imaginations sort of damaged uh, through that process john schofield would you like to unmute your microphone and ask your question hi yes yeah. so uh, i was struck by suhami's phrase um love and care are such derided forces and it made me think that actually imagination itself is a derided force so in, in going forward, trying to explore these things, it's really how can we help people overcome the hesitancy that's built up um, because of derision they've faced in the past? Oh, uh, um, um, uh, Suhaima, do you want to start that one? Yeah, really good question, John. And I think you're right. Like, imagination is definitely seen as... I, I suppose, yeah, derided is the right word. And I think it's interesting. I, I'm trying to think about, you know, why is that? And I think part of the reason is, I suppose, the, th the ways that we value things in general um, are very much in this kind of neoliberal framework of productivity output, you know? And I think when you're suggesting something that's not going to necessarily have a tangible output today, that maybe you'll invest, you know, a lot of hours and there's not going to be a product at the end. I think that everything, every all the parts of messaging in the society around us really disincentivizes that. And I think that that's maybe part of why it's so derided. Um, as well as the fact that obviously lots of forms of imagining are inc include those things that you talked about, like care and love. It's like, you know, imagine, you know, you, you want to imagine a different world because you, you know, a lot of people mention because my children or my children live in a different world or whatever it is. And I think those things are often separated. That, that scene is like, that's childcare, that's family, that's private, that's, that's culture. It's not political. And I think it's also partly about the way that imagination is narrated and it's not narrated as something that's a political force. It's not narrated as something that is, um, you know, radical and important. So, yeah, I think you're right. And I guess the question is to like, how do we change that? I think maybe it's just that, yeah, we create our own narratives around imagination and like what it does and what it can do. Um, but I think also sometimes I, I, I know when I do poetry workshops with adults, the real thing I find is that it's not that people necessarily deride imagination, but I think they're ashamed that they actually don't deride it. Right. And it's like, actually, there is embarrassment that, you know, what, ha what I tend to see happen is that everybody at the beginning is like, oh, yeah, I can't imagine I'm not creative. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And it's this sort of. It's almost, it's quite, there's a bit of bravado to it as well, right? And then when you give people the permission, you say, well, I just want you to write about, you know, your favorite, whatever, just anything imaginative. People really love it. So I think there's also maybe just this element of like the coercive kind of regulation that we all do of each other that's, you know, I don't know, instilled in us in so many different institutions. But yeah, I guess I'm just echoing what you said, but I, I think it's a really good question. muted uh phoebe i'm just trying to remember the question it was about imagination being derided and how we get past that sort of, sort of thing yes it's like that that sort of belittling of it like when we grow up with our imagination being belittled and sidelined and humiliated often how, mm. do, we, how do we reconnect with it mm. yeah at the beginning of the um imagination workshops I, I actually often start by saying um imagination is something that's often called childish because actually we're denied the right to do it as adults so that's why we call it childish but then it becomes this kind of slightly insulting thing to say so it's like it's all back to front um and and i think part of what how we get around that is this this phrase serious play where we're like we don't care we're going to reclaim it and it's serious you know it, it's serious it's playful but it's serious isn't it should be taken seriously and actually there's a moral responsibility to imagine like we we need to imagine in this time more than ever like look at look at the world that we're living in like there's there's absolutely a moral responsibility to do so and there's something about restoring that 
sacredness and and like seriousness of um, imagination that somehow feels really important. Um, and I'm still kind of getting a getting a grip as to what what that looks like. And we're you know we're in the process of of like developing developing that and and that thinking. But um, we've also found that within the spaces that we create, the mo one of the most important things is just creating a really safe space. And I know that's like quite an empty term, like it's a term that's thrown around a lot, safe space, but I guess it's a space where people realize it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to show emotion. And um, we, we really like celebrate, you know, we kind of, there's a gradual process of people reading out the poetry they write, reading out the bits of uh, like creative writing that they write, write. And then the culture in the group is just like, massive celebration even if you just write like two sentences and and you're kind of like oh this is really bad it's like there's just massive celebration and it, it, it creates this very buoyant um culture that i think is is really important thank you thank you and tom any thoughts on that yeah i think this also links to to creativity and this a stigma around um i'm not a creative person how could how could i be creative um and this idea that you lose your creativity as you as you grow up which is obviously so not true you may lose touch with it but you certainly don't lose it and there's opportunities for you to reconnect with it and Rob um, mentioned at the beginning um, coming to one of our events in this large Willy Wonka-esque um, warehouse which um, you know we're, we're a charity focused on children but we also focus on adults and, and families and just that permission to come in and, and play and it's not something that um we found that happened immediately. Usually the child sort of whizzed in and the, and the parent or the carer looked and thought, what's going on here? There's no map, there's no direction, there's no obvious thing for me to get involved with. But slowly over time, we saw people settle into that environment and understand that that was, it was very much their exploration of our space to explore. And so thinking about this idea that Phoebe said, this sort of safe place to come into. Um, and so I'd say, I'd say that, imagination if imagination is daunting then then get involved in a creative act get involved in applied imagination through something really really creative that you do and you'll probably find you're doing it already and work backwards from there great thank you and so roxy roxy piper has a really good question here about about how to make all of this real and tangible in the world roxy Gosh, I've asked so many questions, I can't remember which one it was. Um, yeah. but I, it started I think... with how to harness. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yes. Yeah. So, like, how do you, if you're, if you think a lot um, or imagine a lot and you uh, have a lot of divergent thinking and ideas going on, how do you harness that and sort of decide which are the good ones and um, reach this convergence? So how to go from divergent thinking to convergent thinking, you said. Yes. yes uh, Phoebe, right. let's start with you. Uh, I think convergent thinking is overrated, personally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I, I know what you mean. That like you could just keep, I read your comment in the chat that you could just keep on expanding into this like never ending kind of creativity space that's unbounded and undefined. And, you know, when do you actually converge and create something? Um, I think moving from the imagination space and the creative space into the, okay, what do we want to do together space is a kind of key turning point that, that I've seen. And I think that's really exciting because it's the moment where, you know, you can imagine and you can be in this like very flowing liquid space of possibility, but then actually like the no judge club, like what, what are the kind of nuggets that come out of that? What are the, what are the things that um, a group or a collective or a community go on to actually do out of that collective imagining space. Um, and I think probably the answer is like constraints. Like it's at the end of the workshops when it's like, oh God, we have to go back to like the real world. Let's do something. Let's take some of this forward. There's a, there's a constraint of like uh, time and, and wanting to like do something together. Um, yeah. Great, thank you, Tom. Yeah, I think we're, um, we're living in such a, an interesting and amazing period really in terms of the, the tools that are available for us to use. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about this from an educational context, but more broadly, I think, you know, this is open to everyone, whether it be the digital tools or, or, or even the physical tools um, that are accessible. So my, 
a process that we go down is is obviously you know creative thinking creative ideas but but also what's a, what's available to you and then what's happening in the world around you and how can you bring these all together to start to actually hone in on something that you can do to make a difference to have a positive impact um, and it could be as simple as a, a hobby motor in our in our uh, circumstances that just get people thinking about engineering, but it, or it could be something more complex, um, you know, like augmented reality. But these tools, I think, allow us to start to focus our mind on what's possible. Thank you. Thank you. And Suhaima? Yeah, I don't have a lot to add. Um, I think, I guess, maybe one thing is just if it helps, I think something that can sometimes help is keeping, just keep it, just keeping track, having a way to record things you are thinking because it's likely there's tons of good ideas in there but it's just like as you say trying to like sift through it sometimes can be overwhelming so I don't know if keeping a record whether that's writing whether that's just recording your thoughts in whatever way it works for you um but it is yeah I think I, I don't have a lot that's insightful to say on that particular issue but I, I yeah thanks Sophie, yeah I'm, I was just was thinking Phoebe at the beginning you mentioned that you had bought a poem and I wondered if this might be uh, a good moment, if you still would like to share the poem that you bought. Yeah, I could share. It's not my poem. It's a poem that was created in um, the, the workshop we just came out of. Um, but I'd be very happy to share it. Um, let me just find it. So this is a poem by um, a, a, a person called Kalina, uh, who was part of the Watch It. Um, moral imaginations lab and it was written out of the impossible train story so if you imagine it's about we they just heard um this story about the train and the metaphor of, of covid so it's it's sort of related to that you can pick up on bits from that you are the seed and i am the seeded it was a long time ago but i remember it like it was yesterday the world had taken on a distinct hue of sodden leaves and wrecked promises but the sky was always blue we knew the crash had come at the right time, but the shoulders of the giant were scarred with all the pain he had to endure. I remember the French girl who made us all notice the weeds and the names would be chalked on brick walls. I remember the collectors and the caregivers and the scar stitchers making their way home at midnight, hounded by the disbelievers. My mind became an oven of cool and hot favorites and I felt anger at how money wanted to revamp the way we loved. I felt sad echoes turning my cheeks to felt when I think about the mothers and the granddads and the nieces who spent the late afternoon sunshine trying to say goodbye, but the words were illicit, just a humming. The phantoms and godlikes I met in my travels inched their way along empty streets and large wads of cash castigated the eight men found in a backstreet bar who should have been at home looking after the lost. The movement of love and kindness has left the building and we are now taking to the street in our millions. Can you see us climbing the mountains and the walls and our own memories? We got to the end and we all stood in the streets hugging each other. Our love was becoming an avalanche that becomes powder. I love you. You are the daughter of my daughter. Be clear when you grow up. Be clear that any place where an avalanche of love consumes us will be the real world of our travels and that might be the place to set down roots. Make sure there is a windmill at the end of your road that borders onto a field. The gray horse that stands still, graceful, she is yours. Ride away and enjoy your future. Beautiful, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I well, it would be really interesting if, if any of you who are part of this call, if you might have just things that you might want to share in the chat, which are things that you do in your own life to create that imaginative space uh, in your life. Little practices you might have, uh, things that you find inspiring, anything that you might like to share that other people might find useful. So our next question I'm going to go to, I think it's uh, Alison in Northwich who had a question about um, I, I'm assuming it's the only question. Um, Alison, are you there? Or yeah, Al I'm here. Yes, Al Alison, over to you. Um, well, in our group, we had a really nice discussion about that it might take bravery to, to move from our habitual life into this opportunity to, 
to imagine and it's not something we often get the invite to do so I just wondered if our speakers could share some advice about how to create that safe space that's been mentioned um, in a really sort of practical way because I think lots of us here might be trying with this with our communities this year um, I hope that that mirrors some of the other questions as well about creating a safe and supportive space great thank you so Jaime let's start with you Mm, it's a really good question. Um, you mentioned bravery, and I think when I think about bravery, I think about honesty and vulnerability. Um, and when, and then if I think about where I feel able to be honest and vulnerable, um, it feels even difficult to be honest and vulnerable in my answer, right? And that's because I think if I'm really honest, which I'm trying to be, I think it's really, really difficult to find a truly safe space. Um, and I think that's because of all the different dynamics that exist. But I think, you know, in the UK right now, just to give you an example, um, the prevent policy, which you might have heard of, and if you haven't, it's the same as any countering violent extremism policy across the world. It sounds like something abstract policy, who cares, like doesn't happen, to, you know, doesn't occur, uh, have any impact on our lives. But it, the impact of the prevent policy is that every public sector worker in the UK is conscripted by the government to look out for signs of radicalization amongst people that they work with. So students, pupils, nursing, people, whatever, you know, pa patients. Now the impact of that logic is that it's seeped into other things. So you have counter extremism, you have integration, community cohesion, any narrative that basically like rings a bell in your head that makes you think all oh, Muslims are a bit weird, that's something to do with it. And the impact of this, I think about it a lot, right? Because even in this space right now, it's like, if you truly ask me, you know, what would you want to see in the world? I still feel a bit awkward to mention white supremacy because there's a room full of mainly white people, right? I feel awkward to say it. I feel awkward to talk about it. I feel like, you know, these are the kinds of things that it's difficult to talk about when we think about safe spaces because, you know, there's like always that self-policing that's going to be happening inside people because of fear, right? And because of regulation and punishment of, of, of structures and, and processes so when i know i'm seen through this lens of threat i'm seen through the lens of suspicion i'm seen as backwards barbaric oppressed as simultaneously violent you know all these things to then just speak it already feels like it's just a measure of like can i prove myself can i prove my goodness can i prove my internet can i prove my xyz so then if you ask on some of that you know what is the space going to feel what, what space can we build where you can be truly vulnerable i mean it's hard for me to even invite one person to that space Right, it's hard for me to even invite one person into the space where I can be truly vulnerable. And I think that that's just a really difficult question um, in general, because it also requires us to think about what would what does it take for us to build genuine trust? And I think that's what it is. I think a space doesn't, doesn't get built in one day. A space isn't just like a literal place that you bring people to. I think it's a set of relationships and that can take a long time. It can take a really long time. And I think that pace is really required to, to you know, people to offer to put themselves on the line, right? I'm going to put myself on the line, you put yourself on the line. I'm going to tell you something that's honest but might hurt and you, you're going to tell me something that's honest but might hurt. And now we're being really vulnerable and now maybe we're able to say something a bit more of, of, of kind of, you know, of that stuff. <laughs> so yeah, that's just my reflections on that question, which is a tough one. Thank you, Sahana. Um, Phoebe? I think... Um, for me at least it has something to do with creating a warm like a warm space where people just feel like they're not entering kind of institutionalized um spaces where you know you've got your badge and you've got to talk about who you are and what job you do and what your role is and how much worth you have in this society um and that's something that we we just we don't like in in the sessions there's no like round of introductions it's just like it's human beings um together and I think I think also there's something about the the intention of the host like what I what is the person who's hosting really there for if if there's any sort of desire to extract and and harvest and kind of get the right uh, output so that you can show that to you know your funder or whatever it is like you, I think there's something there that I think groups can really uh, pick up on and, and so that going into a place and really just feeling like very open to the fact that nothing might come out of this workshop, that that, that was really important with this imagination lab. I was speaking with uh, Georgie from Onion Collective before, and I was just saying, like, 
yeah, it, it might just be that nothing comes out of this and we just have like a, a good time. And, um, and you just have to be okay with that because as soon as there's this urgency or desperation to like, I don't know, it, it's, it's just, you can feel it. It's not authentic, is it? When it's like, there's some hidden agenda. So I think, yeah, I think that's what it's about. Thank you, thank you. I, when I was, uh, when I used to teach permaculture to young adults, I always did as much as I could to make it feel unlike school. And one of my favorite things was I always had a mattress in the corner of the classroom. And I said, if you get, if you feel sleepy, don't just spend the whole thing doing like that. Go and have a little sleep for half an hour and then come back again. It was always nice. It was usually someone having a little snooze in the corner of the classroom. Uh, Tom, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think we've um, we've picked up on this kind of idea of collective imagination and, and a, a kind of socialization of imagination and that is um, just just really exciting that the prospect of, of having the courage to go out and find others and um, collectively build together and not think that I have to do this on my own or um, whether it be friends or meeting through other networks I just think this idea that you can start to bring people together to collectively imagine is really a wonderful prospect um, and I guess thinking about, you know, courage now, it, as we emerge from COVID, you know, so much has, has changed in such a short period of time. And so I feel like there's opportunity out there really to grasp hold of. Um, and I guess one example that comes to mind is cities, you know, cities are just not going to be the same ever again. I mean, they're going to change quite radically from the way we live in them, the way we move around in them way we interact with people within them um, and so for me that's like a calling card to say let's let's start to reimagine cities you know lo local area by local area or towns or other or other areas I think there's opportunity out there thank you so uh, maybe we maybe maybe our last question we'll see Mike you had a question about community power which brings us back to the uh, the overarching theme of uh, the three weeks that this is part of, Mike. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, one of the things I think is like imagination is great for coming up with the ideas. It's the problem you have is when you try to implement them and you come up against the whole system which doesn't want your your nice new world to, to emerge, and um, which I, I've personally experienced many times in, in my life. <laughs> Uh, the Iraq war being one of the main ones, I think, that springs to mind. But uh, I'm just wondering, yeah, how do we move past, you know, how do we make that step, you know, make our imaginations reality when we, when we are, which tends to come into conflict with what's the existing status quo? Is there any ideas on how, how we do that in uh, how we build our power to do that? Thank you, Mike. Tom, let's start with you. Um, oh, this is, this is, yeah, this is a challenge. Um, and, you know, when you're talking about big global events, that, that, is, that is challenging as well to think about how you can impact and influence that. I guess I go back to um, small is beautiful and beginning small um, and growing that is, is a way that I see that we can, we can bring about change. Um, I think it's hard to start big and to, to think that we can change the world. Um, overnight but I think if we can grow through small is beautiful concept then I think there's an opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Phoebe? I think two things, one is we need maybe funders who are willing to fund the things that come out of you know these imagine imaginings and funders who just are willing to, to give um, funding without uh, you know, without the usual re restrictions and KPIs and, um, you know, really devolving power to those communities who, you know, out of out of such imagination exercises or process of imagining that they're hosting themselves can feel like they have uh, resources to put those things into practice, but don't have to fit it to the agenda of the old system or to their funders or yeah, so there's something there about, you know, radical funders, funders who are willing to let go of power and control. And, you know, there are they are out there. And, and so just celebrating um, those funders and, and kind of doing a call call to arms for more of them. Um, and then the other thing is, is, you know, beyond funding, like the No Judge Club, like it, it doesn't need funding. It just needs uh, a space to, for people to come together and 
I think in this current moment, we need to be building parallel. Like we need to, we need to just be building things in parallel to the current system. And, uh, you know, there's, um, I think it's Meg Wheatley talks about pockets of sanity. You know, we've just got to build those pockets and, and yeah, connect them together. Thank you, thank you. And Suhaima. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, that's the question, isn't it, Mike? Um, I think, uh, so one thing I was thinking about was how, you know, during this pandemic, so many things we were told could never be implemented had just been implemented like that. Um, and I think it was, was it Portugal, maybe, or Spain, where they just um, overnight released all everyone in immigration detention? And it was just like, hang on, so we, so we never needed to do that in the first place. And I think that makes me think, okay, so it is possible for things to change overnight, change can be implemented so the question then becomes how can our change be implemented and I think this is where it becomes like you know you, two things have to be true at the same time that we don't want the current system to be the system in which our changes are implemented because we actually want a different system but at the same time you know are there things that we need to be doing now because of survival so like a classic irony being we don't believe in nation states and borders but people require and deserve citizenship to access needs so I think some of it is playing with those ironies. The other thing I always remember um, in the introduction to Kay and Andrew's book, he says um, Malcolm needed Martin and Martin needed Malcolm. And what he's talking about there is that Malcolm X was obviously seen as the radical, the outsider, the completely like, you know, unapologetic, non-institutional voice. And Martin Luther King was seen as the more reformist voice, even though you know that's contested, really, uh, historical narrative. But the point being that actually without Malcolm having these kind of radical ideas that everyone says, no, they can never be implemented, Martin wouldn't have even been listened to. And that's not to say that the civil rights movement really did, you know, changed a lot for people, but it did change, it did change things. And I think there's a conversation there about maybe some, some of the, like, some people's roles in the world, this is, I guess maybe this is just what I've settled with, is that like, it's okay to just be the person who has these really radical ideas that just pushes people because that still shifts the kind of the, the, the imagining of everyone else. And, and if you can shift the status quo, that middle ground a little bit, I don't know, maybe that has some value, but I think, I think it's just a constant to and fro, you know, push, pull, two things being true, three, three things being true, juggling things. Um, and, you know, I think this for me is where faith comes in really handy because it's like, you know what, maybe all the changes I want to see won't happen in this world right now in my life, but it's that, you know, that hope and that kind of, you know, maybe down the line there will be those changes. So yeah, bit of, bit of uh, juggling, I think. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Wow. Um, I'm going to invite Fanny now to share who has had the unenviable task of trying to uh, capture all of the, uh, ideas and inspiration and things that have swept past us this evening. Fanny, can I hand over to you? Hello. Yes, sure. I'm going to share my screen. Wow, well, so it has been uh, Super inspiring and um, so grateful I've been able to to be here um, today and, and and try to capture the essence of the conversation. So, as imagining is about a big mess, I reckon <laughs> this drawing is also a little of a mess and without structure, but sharing that with you. So here you can see a bit the process. Here we go. So thank you so much uh, for this, this amazing conversation. Mm -hmm. 